Thank you, uh, Don. So, um, like Don mentioned, I'm with the USDA ARS in Bellsville, Maryland. And I've got a slide on my background because it might be important to bring that up. Um, so the title of my talk is uh, Leaf to Canopy, Measuring CO2 and Temperature Effects on Crop Growth. But there's really three things I want to cover. Uh, one is why temperature might be changing. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about climate change and how that might impact food security. And then we're going to talk about what the actual experimental measurements tell us as far as crop responses go. That'll be the majority of our focus. And the last thing we'll do is look at some of the model predictions as to what the impact of changing climate could be on crop yields, okay. mostly uh, globally as opposed to just regionally. So I would like to keep this uh, kind of open. So if you guys have questions or comments, please feel free to you know, interrupt or, or uh, shout out. And uh, I think it's a little more entertaining that way. So um, <clears throat> who am I? So as I mentioned, I'm an agricultural engineer with the USDA. Uh, I have kind of a split assignment. I'm both an experimentalist and a modeling, a modeler for crop production. So this is just a picture of some of uh, the students and some of the experimental work that I do. Um, I work with another plant scientist as well as a soil scientist, and I'm an engineer, so we have quite an interdisciplinary group of uh, people working on the project. And so I, I get to get my hands dirty both in field and some chamber uh, studies, but then we also do quite a bit of modeling exercise on the computer in the off season, and then we do some kinds of simulation studies. Uh, I talked about some of these earlier this morning. Um, so anyhow, I've been working on this in about 15 years, and I'm now the lead scientist on the project. So that gives you some sense of, of uh, I guess, the resources that USDA is putting into this. So like I mentioned, uh, I'm hoping that when you guys leave after uh, th this hour or so that you have some idea, and you probably do already, but you have maybe even more of an idea of what exactly is it about crop responses that are likely to change to uh, a changing climate and why should we care about it? Okay. So uh, like I mentioned, there's three main topics we're going to cover. One is the linkages between a changing climate and food security. We'll talk about the relationship of crop growth and development with some of these climatic factors. And then we'll talk about model predictions that are drawn from these responses. So the first thing is looking at these linkages with uh, a changing climate and, and basically the idea is, you know, why should we care? Uh, okay, so here are some, uh, some facts. So by 2050, uh, the world population will be over 9 billion. And actually, the most recent UN estimates are about 9.7. Okay, so that's over, I think we're at 7 billion right now. So we're talking less than, you know, less than 40 years from now. Okay. The demand for cereal crops, and most of these are grains, okay, wheat, rice, soybean, is going to increase by 70% by this year, primarily because of the population growth, but also because people are starting to change their diets to reflect Western, Western preferences. So if we can't maintain our food capacity to support both the population growth and this demand, we're going to have issues with commodity prices and, and not, uh, not just supply as, as well. For many of the developing countries, uh, agriculture is the primary economy, and it's really the only source of livelihood. So a lot of the farmers in these areas are subsistence farmers. Okay, they're barely making by with low input agriculture. And unfortunately, what we'll see is a lot of the climate change impacts are actually affecting these developing areas in the world more uh, uh, to a larger extent than they are in some of the developed parts. Okay, so these are the people that are going to get hit the hardest. Um, and just as it is with, with developed countries, there's still a, a huge issue with limited access to land area and natural resources. And these are typically in conflict with economic development and even conservation practices also. Okay, that came up uh, a bit this morning. So some of the scientists who are experts on this particular topic, which I am not, uh, I'm just re reiterating some of the facts, that they're estimating an annual 1.75% increase over today's current production rates are going to be required to provide this food sufficient, sufficient food capacity. So this doesn't sound like a whole lot, but I'll, I'm going to show you some slides that will explain why it actually is going to be pretty challenging for us. And so because of this, we're going to have potentially food security is going to be one of the key global challenges. And there's been a ton of research in the scientific community just focused on this topic. So, uh, I thought it would be good to kind of explain or, or give you an example of worldwide agricultural production in terms of land area for the, the, the basic, the main staple crops. So cereal crops, cereal crops, excuse me, including things like uh, barley, maize, millet, oats, rice, sorghum, wheat, these are the majority of our food supply, okay, worldwide. And this is a plot of the total grain harvested area across the world over different decades. And so you can see up until about the mid-80s, it was increasing. 
And now we've kind of, past the 80s, we've kind of hit this uh, gradual decline in land area for these cereal crops. And at the same time, though, you'll note that maize, rice, and wheat, which are just a subset of these total uh, grains, are actually slightly increasing. It's got a positive slope. But that increase is actually coming from this, the area of all the grains together. So we're not actually putting any more land in production at this point. That's kind of a take home message from this slide. Okay, so one question may be, do we have more area to put into practice? Um, but again, assuming these current trends continue, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to need a 1.75% increase in yield per unit area then. If we can't add more land, then we're going to have to increase our yield over the existing land. And this is really where a lot of uh, science is focused on. Is you may have heard of this idea of getting more crop per drop and other kind of catchy, catchy slogans to try to increase yield per unit area. And this is actually the tricky part is it's not just a 1.75 increase over today's production. It's every year we need to keep doing that. Okay, that's because the population keeps growing. And so if, if uh, before we're just looking at total area in production, and now what we're looking at is yield per unit area. Okay, so this is now, now maybe the 1.75% increase. And so this is looking at our three major crops again, maize, rice, and wheat per, per decade. And you can see this nice, sharp, linear increase. A lot of this is because of the Green Revolution, uh, more intensive production of monocultures. And so the, the current rates of grain yield are linearly increasing. So this looks really good. Okay, now this part gets a little complicated, and I had to keep rereading this and thinking about it. Um, but the annual relative rate is actually decreasing. Well, how can that be? If you've got this solid linear increase, what do you mean they're decreasing? What that means is the annual increase from the previous value is actually proportionately less. And so as you keep going higher and higher, each subsequent year, the actual increase is getting smaller and smaller in proportion to the previous yield from the previous year. Okay. And so that's why um, this isn't going to, even if we were able to continue at the same trend, we're not going to be able to meet the projection for population growth by mid-century. Okay. And that's really where a lot of the concern from the scientists are coming from. Um, and so just to show you, so this relative rate is now, used to be really high at the beginning, and now it's actually dropped off. It's about 1.3% on um, today's, today's numbers. Okay. So the take-home message is if, if the annual increase in grain yield continues at the same rate, we're going to fall uh, far below the projected demand for these crops. Now, of course, you know, this is a lot of doom and gloom, and, and people are going to adapt, but this is just looking at the current situation. Okay. So kind of keep that in mind that this is not, uh, hopefully not as bad as it seems. That's actually, it's a great question. I just had this conversation at lunchtime. Yeah, I mean, so, and actually, some, this graph's going to explain some of that. Um, but, yeah, so most of the top uh, producers are developed countries where you have high input agriculture, right? So you have chemical fertilizers, you usually have irrigation, you have, uh, you know, intensive use of, of uh, pesticides and herbicides, compared to the majority of agricultural regions are in developed countries where it's low input, okay? They have, or, they have organic fertilizers like manure, and their rain-fed production. And that's where you could see the biggest potential increases. So how do we get that area to increase? And that's, that's a challenge. I mean, I know there are scientists that are working with those populations. The part of the issue is infrastructure, but yeah, go ahead. And the, the other big issue, too, is post-harvest losses yeah. are shockingly high. That's right. Food waste is a huge issue. It's actually not even food waste, but you're right. Even at the farm gate, getting from the farm gate to market, we're losing a tremendous amount of food. And so I don't, I don't have a good, you know, a good explanation for how to address that, but the first part is public awareness, I think, and, and that, that maybe that comes down to infrastructure. And technology. And technology, yeah. And so that's where, I mean, part of it is it seems like it's pretty shocking this doom and gloom, but there are these opportunities where if we're able to reduce some of that food waste and improve productivity from some of these uh, poorer nations, that, that can come a long way to trying to address food demand. Yeah. Any, any other thoughts? Yeah, okay, good. So. Yeah, and this is actually a perfect time for that question, because now we're looking at is rice, wheat, and maize for the most uh, developed countries. Okay, so these are the countries that are the biggest producers of these commodities. And what you can see is we've plateaued. Okay, so the crop modelers have this uh, kind of categorization of yields from crops, and the farmers probably have it too, where you have potential yield, which is the absolute 
maximum yield you get from crops that's only constrained by genetics and, and, and the environment. Okay, so no management restrictions. Then you have you know, attainable yield, which is pretty, pretty high, and then, then you have the actual yield, which, which is what we're usually getting. So it's generally thought that if we're plateauing here, that suggests that for these developed nations, we're already hitting that, that either attainable or just about potential yield for those crops, with given the same varieties we're looking at. Um, for some of the lower input production, you can see we are still having some increases, but we're starting to tap off again for these highest yielding locations. Um, for maize, it's not as dramatic, but you can see, and this may start becoming a long, a long trend, that the U.S. is starting to plateau the last few years. Okay, so that may be kind of telling us we're not actually able to start getting more yield per acre, at least for these developed countries, not for the developing world. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's kind of a... Yep, that's, so that's kind of just what we talked about, just kind of summarizing the slide. Is everybody still with me? Yeah, okay. Okay, so all this is going to have major food security challenges taking into effect that we have a limited land area basis and we have major population growth. So there are two, I guess, physical ways, not thinking economics or social aspects or anything, but physical ways of trying to uh, meet this need is to increase the land base for agriculture or to increase the yield per unit land area. And as far as increasing land for agriculture, uh, even in the developed countries, we're seeing rapid urbanization. And that's continuing to take away productive land for agriculture. Part of the issue is the land that's, that's great for farming is also land that's great for you know, retail development or housing developments. Okay, it has the same qualities, the same type of slope, and so there's a lot of competition for that demand. Um, actually, that's what I yeah, just said that right here. Okay, so that, that's part of the issue that we have a limited land resource base and we have multiple competing uh, needs and uses for that, for that land. The other option is looking at increasing yield per unit area. Um, and so this is a good discussion we just brought up with developing countries. Maybe there's more potential over there to try to, because they're much farther away from this potential, there's this major yield gap, and that may be an opportunity. Um, but we still have competing land claims, not just for land now, but water resources, fertilizer resources, labor, and capital that lead to more competitive pressures for trying to get more production per unit of land. So those are things that have to be considered. doesn't mean we can't do it, but these are just things that, that have, to be, uh, have to be handled. And so then the question is, have we reached this potential yield? And it sounds like maybe in some cases we have, in some cases we haven't. So that's going to be an active area of research in the near future, or it's actually ongoing. Okay, so given all this as a background, well, what's going to be the impact of climate change on top of this? Okay, and I have to issue a caveat here because I'm sure I'm going to ask this question either this session or the next one. I am, I'm not a climatologist. Okay, so I, I deal with crops and crop responses to whether it's genetic, uh, environment, or management inputs. So the, the people that are doing the estimations of the climate change, they basically use, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it, they use um, what they call an ensemble of GCMs, which are global circulation models, to make their predictions. And so that's kind of the best science that we have to do this. But I'm not an expert in that area, so if you ask me questions, I probably can't answer them. I'll try. Uh, but what I do is I use the product, at least for, this, for some, of the, some of the research we're doing. So, uh, and we can talk about that if you guys have questions, just interrupt. Okay. So what does climate change refer to? It's uh, essentially at its basic level, it's a shift in the historic mean or variability over a period of time for major, major factors. Okay. And those predictions that come from these models, they generally have certain statistical probabilities. And they usually include, it's not just a global level, they include some regional focuses, and not just annual cycles, but also within season, which would coincide with things like, you know, the, the production season. So uh, not only do you use ensembles of these uh, general circulation models to estimate the average impact, but they have something called uh, different greenhouse gas emission scenarios. Somebody, have you guys heard that? It's GHG emissions. So basically... Lots of, lots of activities, whether it's human or other uh, sources of that, different green, greenhouse gas emission scenarios are kind of trapping solar radiation and heating up the planet. And that's the basis for a lot of these predictions that these GCMs are making. So uh, where the climate change predictions, why they vary so much is there's a lot of assumptions made in the future about how these different greenhouse gas emission scenarios can vary based on human activity. Okay, and that is a very crude way of kind of providing a background to, into the climate change science. Any, any questions on that? Okay, that's probably, I'm not sure, it could be good or bad, but that's, that's where we are. So these predictions tend to be pretty spatially coarse. Okay, so we're talking about 250 to 600 kilometers, square kilometers. 
Um, they're usually temporarily coarse. I mentioned seasonal, they can be monthly. Although now, today, there are many statistical downscaling methods that people are using to get these on finer spatial scale and also a finer temporal scale. And the question you might be thinking is, well, why do we need that? And that's what I hope to address in the next couple, couple slides. Um, so we mentioned this, that there's different emission scenarios. Uh, and then what would depend on the prediction also would be the future decade we're looking at, okay, whether it's 10 years from now or 100 years from now, the location, and then the time period of interest. So if it's, if it's one year, one month, one day, three months, that would influence the projection as well. Okay, so uh, there are multiple spatial scales involved in this. Um, multiple temporal scales, which we mentioned. You can even get hourly predictions. And again, you might be wondering why do we need that, and I'll try to address some of those questions. Um, so we want to really think about long-term averages, but also these short-term, uh, what we call extreme events, can be really important. And I'll just give a quick example. If you have a, a grain filling or, or pollen germination, and you've got a couple of hours of temperatures exceeding some optimal threshold, that's enough to really ruin the pollen vigor. Okay, and there's been a lot of studies that show that. And so that's why even these hourly predictions could actually be important for trying to assess, uh, you know, maybe, maybe yield impacts of climate change or assess the capability of land to sustain a particular uh, commodity in the future. So for agriculture, we're primarily concern, concerned with three big factors. You have air temperature, CO2 concentration, and rainfall, so with CTW, and their interactions. Sometimes this gets overlooked, but this is really where the strain on kind of the resource dollars gets put, is trying to study these interactions, because now you've got factorial combinations, which require a lot more intensive resources to look at all these possible combinations of factors. This is a, a little dated now, and I think there's a gentleman who spoke uh, right before me. He probably had more updated stuff for our region, although I suspect I haven't changed that much. And th this is looking at the Northeast. Uh, if we just look at mid-century, I split these up between winter and summer months, and unfortunately these are degrees Celsius. But uh, this is showing the summer month we're expected to have a daily increase of about one to four and a half daily increase in temperature by mid-century. Okay, so that's pretty significant. We'll talk about why in a, in a, few, a few more slides. Um, in our region, we're actually expected to get an increase in rainfall. So a lot of major productive growing regions throughout the world, including the western U.S., are expected to have uh, prolonged periods of, of uh, decreased rainfall, re rainfall, but in our area that's actually not going to be an issue, although we may have an issue with more extreme events, more flooding events happening. Okay, so likely we're going to have a warmer, wetter climate. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Okay. Some crops will respond really positive to this. So uh, kind of summarize, we're probably going to have warmer, more frequent hot days and nights. And again, this could be good or bad depending on the commodity. Uh, we may have increased annual rainfall. This doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen during the growing season. Okay. Uh, heat wave frequency and duration, although this seems to be likely more towards the end of the century than in, in the mid-century. And we have certain environmental impacts, which I'm not going to cover for this talk, but uh, salt intrusion, land loss because of salt intrusion and uh, higher um, sea levels. These extreme events we talked about, seasonal shifts in climate and ecological issues. You may have, have looked at some of the studies from the pest and disease people and weed people have shown that things like kudzu, which are historically kind of the bane of the south, have started to gradually creep up to northern latitudes. And this is because of increasing temperatures. And that's going to become an issue for crop management also. OK. Uh, some more specific concerns from the ag, the ag sector. You're going to have an dur increased duration of the frost-free season. OK, that's not a bad thing, right? So this isn't all going to be doom and gloom. Uh, in general, you're going to have an earlier spring, summer start, and a late summer end. Of course, some of that could depend on rainfall when the rain's occurring. And photoperiod sensitivity is going to change. It could uh, determine what crop is going to most benefit from that. Um, heat stress is going to be probably negative. Availability of water could be positive or negative, depending. Suitability of arable land. Uh, land is likely to change throughout the region as far as some lands that maybe historically are well suited for one crop in 30, 40 years from now may be better suited for a different crop. Okay, so that's something that would have to be considered. Um, and I mentioned the biotic issues. And we're mostly going to focus, actually that's what we are going to focus on the next couple of lectures is, is just on crop yields for the rest of this, rest of this talk. Okay, but obviously there's going to be major impacts on livestock and fisheries as well. And these are generally negative, but not always. Okay, and you'll understand why as we go through the talk. Okay, I'm going to skip over that, I think, in the interest of time. 
and just suggest that while some locations are benef or may benefit, most predictions are showing that yields are predicted to significantly decline. And I have to say, again, this is the whole doom and gloom thing. Almost no of these predictions look at adaptation. Even simple adaptations like adjusting planting dates, nobody's been looking at that. They're starting to. But so what you're seeing in the literature and, and from a lot of, even what I'm going to show now, is kind of the worst case scenarios, okay? I mean, so it still looks like things are going to be negative, but maybe not as negative. And adaptation, people adapt, and we know it's going to make a big difference. And from a research basis, that's kind of where we're looking to go is working at it. Yep. I had the same, same thing. I started looking at planning dates, management options, and genetics is the big, the big thing. Yeah. Any, any other comments on that? Okay. So um, based on, on all this, some of the, the I guess, latest predictions mean that even a two-degree increase in mean temperature by 2100, and we talked about just mid-century in our area was going to be between 1.1 and 4.5, a two-degree increase in the current one of the, one of the low, lower emission scenarios, which means less of an impact, is likely to destabilize the global farming system. And so what, what I want to do in the rest of the lecture is explain why. Okay. And again, this is a worst case scenario. Okay. So please don't walk out of here wanting to either hit me or jump off a cliff or something like that. Okay. It's not the, not the purpose of this. Okay. So relationship of crop growth and climate factors. So what I wanted to take a few minutes and talk about is where the data is coming from. Um, and Basically, you can think of, you know, you can't go out to the field and get climate change data, okay, because the field is at conditions that they are today. A lot of the predictions involve changes in CO2 and temperature and rainfall. We can't very easily simulate that in the field, so we need to use some kind of artificial methods of doing that. So uh, you can think of the most least natural would be a growth chamber with electric lights, okay. The advantage to using a growth chamber is you can control every individual factor you can imagine if they're good, if they're good chambers. So you can really kind of isolate one factor at a time, and that's important if you want to do modeling work or if you're going to isolate physiological responses. Okay, uh, my group uses these uh, outdoor growth chambers, which are, they're sealed block boxes, but they're opaque or they're transparent to sunlight. And so we can do really neat things, like we can measure photosynthetic rate of the whole plant, transpiration rates. And so that's still kind of artificial because you have this bo uh, boundary, but now it's getting a little bit more natural. Then you can think about a greenhouse, it's even more natural. Um, open top chambers, which you might have heard about, these basically are just kind of open sheets of plastic in the field that are open at top, and then scientists can control CO2 a little better. You can't isolate as many factors as you could in some of the other chamber studies. So you, you get what's called confounding. So you can't really attribute exactly what's happening physiologically just to one factor, because now you've got differences in soil and temperature and humidity. And then probably the most natural would be these free air CO2 enrichment rings. Uh, and here's a top-down picture of that. And that's where people, scientists, will have basically a ring set around a plot in a field, and they'll inject CO2 into that ring. Okay, so that's the most natural, but there are some issues with that as well. But this gives you a sense of uh, where that is from and coming from. And having said that, what I'm going to do is mostly summarize results from the, the phase systems, but I could easily have done it for any other ones. I just think uh, it was actually already done for me, so I took the easy way out to do this. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but this is just uh, kind of a visual of what's the three main climate change factors and how they might affect ultimately yield. Okay, that's what we're going to dive into next. So... Uh, we're going to talk about crop responses to CO2, then temperature, and then one slide on, on rainfall, uh, and then I'll finish up this topic. Okay. So the ambient CO2 level is now in excess of 400 part per million. Okay. That means for every million particles of air, you've got 400 that are, that are um, elevated CO2. Or, excuse me, you've got 400 that are at the CO2 level. And this, I, I, I'm probably wrong about this, but I think pre-industrial revolution, that was about 280. Okay. So that, that's been the, the rise in, in CO2 level. And it, it's continuing... All the predictions have this continuing to, be, continuing to increase. So anywhere from 20% to 100% over the current, uh, the current values. And CO2 is actually really pretty positive for crop response alone. It's thought of as a fertilization effect. So most crops are generally responding positively to CO2. It's a substrate for photosynthesis. Okay. And it depends on the biochemical pathway that they use to do their photosynthetic processing. So this is the basis for CO2, and this actually comes from some of my experimental work. Uh, this is a C3 crop, potato, soybean, uh, rice would have this kind of response. This is what we call an ACI curve. So this is a leaf level net photosynthetic rate on the y-axis, and on the x is the ambient CO2 concentration. And so kind of what you see is that ambient CO2 at 400 or about this level. And as you start increasing CO2, a C3 crop is going to, in general, if all our conditions are optimal, you're going to have this kind of nonlinear increase in CO2 before it saturates. So that's a positive enrichment effect. 
A C4 crop like, like maize and I think sorghum, um, this is a similar plot except this is now internal CO2, but so we're about, over here is about ambient levels. We're already saturated. Okay, so that means C3, resp C3 response is gonna be positive. C4 response is gonna be almost nothing. Okay, none of these are negative. They're all positive responses to CO2, but we're just not gonna see much for C4 crops. So that's kind of the basis for why we get these responses, but things get a little bit more complicated as always. So this is end of season average leaf level responses from these phase systems I talked about. This is at a 50% increase in CO2 level. Okay, this comes from one of my colleagues, uh, Bruce Kimball. And what he did is he went through, I don't know, 18, 20 different studies from FACE and just kind of aggregated the values. And so you're looking at the relative change uh, due to, CO2, to elevated CO2 compared to 400. Okay, so anything in the plus range here means you have an increase and a negative would mean you have a decrease compared to today's values. So for almost all commodities except for C4 grasses, we're actually seeing an increase in yield. And now you're probably sitting there, sitting there saying, well, Dave, you just said only C3 crops are going to respond positively. Why are we seeing C4? And in fact, they don't know. <laughs> the authors don't know why that happened. We never saw that in our, in our chambers. I suspect the reason is because other factors were not held equal. Okay. But that is the result that they saw with a lot of C4 crops. Maybe not the grasses, but the crops, they were getting about a 10% increase. With C3, we're about a 15, 12 to 15% increase, and these all vary. What would be some the of, of, of C4 Yeah, I don't know how they divided that, to be honest. I mean, right, because maize, maize was considered a grass, right? Right. Well, I know and, uh, things like lamb's quarter or beef mm -hmm. plant, but uh, I'm just trying to get my hand on what, what, what it was. In that group. Yeah, I, honestly, I don't, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. Okay. Yeah, I, you can ask me. I can go back to the, the reference and get it to you later. <laughs> yeah, these, okay, that's the question, right. Okay, so these were faith systems. <clears throat> so they were grown. Some of these were grown in Arizona. Some were grown in Europe. Uh, so there's no control over temperature. So they were at ambient in the sense that whatever traditional, typical location, whatever typical values they were at that location, that's what was experienced by the crop. So this also means whatever the soil conditions were, that's what got confounded into the value. Whatever the rainfall was, that gets confounded into the value. Whatever the fertilizer was, it gets confounded into there. And that's where I think why the C4s may have been a little bit higher than we would have expected. Yeah. So, I'm sorry? The C4 crops in general have higher and that's right. C4 crop in general will have a higher uh, tolerant to temperature responses too. The, the, I don't really have that in here, but the temperature band is, is, uh, is broader for C4 than C3 as far as negative impacts. Yeah. Um, this is showing that was photosynthesis, photosynthesis response, and this is now the yield response. Okay. And so again, you see for most crops, there's a positive response. Uh, C4, again, you do see. Uh, for sorghum anyway, uh, you see positive or negative depending on uh, the fertilizer and water levels. Okay, so this is where things start to get a little complicated. So you do have to consider soil fertility as far as why you were getting these certain responses in and out. But the, the grain yields, and this is what we are talking about earlier in the lecture, we're looking at, because of the CO2 response, between 16 and 32 percent increase. So that may be, okay, we're, we're increasing our yield per unit acre because of that. Okay, that, may be, that may help our, our food production. Um, I'm going to, I I'm realize I'm probably talking too much. I've get, so I'm going to have to, oh no, we've got till 4 o'clock, right? Oh, okay, we're, we're fine. Okay, so um, that's kind of a yield and photosynthesis. But then uh, CO2 has other kind of positive effects too. And, and one of these is the reduction in stomatal conductance. So if you guys remember your biology, um, you have many of these openings in the leaf called stomata, right? And for photosynthesis, you've got CO2 diffusing into the cavity, okay, and then you've got water vapor diffusing out because you've got a hole in the plant. Okay. One of the things, it doesn't matter if it's a C3 or a C4 crop, the stomates are always not shutting, but they're closing in response to elevated CO2. And that makes kind of intuitive sense because if you've got a higher CO2 on the outside of the plant, that gradient between outside and inside is, is not as sharp. and so. The, the plant is basically kind of saturating that area where CO2 is being fixed into photosynthesis. Okay, so the take-home message is CO, uh, stomach conductance is closing, which means you're going to have less water use on a per unit biomass for C3 or C4 crops. Okay, that's pretty good, but the negative thing could be that we're getting higher yields and higher biomass, which means on a total plant basis, you may actually have more water use because you've got larger growth. 
Okay, so you have all these kind of trade-offs depending on what scale you look at. But anyhow, this is the uh, same thing. This is phased data averaged over a whole bunch of different environmental conditions. You see, for all crops, you're getting declines of 25% or greater in leaf level, leaf level stomatal conductance. Okay, and here there's no issues. This all make intuitive sense. The literature is all in agreement on this. And then this is how it translates to seasonal water use. Okay, so you have that stomatal conductance closing, and now this is how much water is being used on a whole plant basis. And in general, you do see most of these are reduced. Uh, however, for across all C3 and C4 crops that face people study, they're getting no response. Okay, and that is because the plants tend to be bigger, so they are using more water, even though on a per unit mass, they may be more efficient. So kind of a summary here, um, for C3 crops, you have reduced stomatal conductance. I didn't really talk about this, but you get a warmer canopy as a result, and that has other issues, which we're not going to get into. Uh, higher photosynthetic rate, increased water use efficiency. Uh, we didn't talk about this either, but you generally have a lower nitrogen content, which is good or bad. Okay, it's probably bad if you're thinking about it from a quality perspective, because that leads to protein. Uh, but you do have higher biomass and higher yields, and this is about a 16 to 32% increase for the grains. Okay. For C4 crops, you have reduced amount of conductance, increased water use efficiency, lower nitrogen content. Uh, we did see those higher yields, but I'm not really convinced that that's what's really happening. Okay, I think that's just from that one particular uh, study. So, okay, CO2 fertilization looks good. Life, life is good. We, maybe we can handle some of these uh, requirements we need to improve or increase our global uh, yield response. So what's the deal with temperature? <clears throat> Well, just like CO2, all air temperatures are expected to increase for nearly all uh, agri agri agriculturally productive regions across the world. There are, there are strong geospatial dependencies, so you're going to have some variation in how temperature is varying throughout a regional perspective. It is the primary driver for the crop life cycle. Okay? Temperature affects everything. Okay? It affects uh, gas exchange processes. So photosynthesis, like the question was brought up about C3 versus C4 crops having different responses to temperature. So it's going to affect photosynthesis, the gas exchange processes. It has a primary effect on crop developmental processes, emergence to stem elongation, to flowering, to grain fill period. This is strongly impacted by, by temperature. Um, canopy growth, the expansion of the leaves, the interception of solar radiation, the morphology or the shape of the canopy, that's all strongly impacted by air temperature. And then also a carbon allocation. Okay, how is carbon, once it's fixed by photosynthesis into biomass, where does it go? That actually has a big impact from temperature, and that can affect your harvest index, okay, how much of that crop is actually edible, edible yield or agronomic yield. So, okay, given all that, why aren't warm temperatures a good thing? Okay, and the best example I found, this is actually a USDA slide. <clears throat> um, this happens to be corn and soybean, but you can imagine this would be for other crops. And we're looking at relative plant growth rate versus uh, daily air temperature. And the first thing you see is for corn, for example, these are different colors. Those colors are responding to different growth stages or different developmental stages. So the green is uh, vegetative growth. Okay, and you can kind of see this has got a different optimal temperature than reproductive growth. And so you kind of see there's a sharp, or maybe not a sharp, but there's a peak at which these processes are optimum. And if you go below or above that peak, you're going to have a decline. And then you see other crops have the same responses. Uh, soybean's similar, but it has a different shape, but the same idea. Okay. So this begins to tell us the basis of why warmer temperatures might not be such a good thing. Um, okay, I'm going to not go into that. But going back to those curves, you have this concept of cardinal temperatures that are characterizing plant sensitivity. And so you have, a, in the literature, they call this a base temperature, and that's the minimum value below which you're not going to get any plant growth. Plants can't survive at that, that, that temperature. You have the optimum temperature, and that's where we saw that was the peak of that curve, right? That's the peak where you're getting this optimum grain filling or optimum flowering or optimum leaf formation. And then you have a maximum temperature above which that plants can't grow or they'll suffer permanent damage. And so if you were to look at some of the cardinal temperatures for these major crops, you get the following table. Any questions yet on this? OK. <clears throat> so these are some of the major grain crops and some other crops as well. And uh, this is the optimum temperature. So this is that value that's right at the peak. OK, so if you go above or below that, you're going to start sliding down that optimum yield response. OK, this, this is the vegetative level, and this is the reproductive optimum. Okay, and so you can see all the crops differ in terms of their cardinal temperatures. 
Okay, and I will tell you that the concern that a lot of the climate or a lot of the crop scientists have is that majority of crops worldwide are grown at regions that are right at those optimums. Okay, and that's really why you see a lot of these predictions are showing that we're going to have negative impacts on crop yields. Okay, again, this is non-adaptive, but that's where the basis for those kind of doom and gloom observations are coming from. So a small change in temperature above that optimum can cause dramatic effects. And this is an example of that. These were data taken from the field. Um, this is for some of those commodities we just looked at. This would be the yield. This, so the green is kind of the yield under optimal conditions. Okay. And, and these are the optimal temperatures for those, those crops. And then if we were to grow those crops at just 28 degrees, you can see how the yield is going to drop off. Now for crops that have close to a 28 degree optimum, it's not that, that, not that big a difference. So like sorghum or soybean, of course, there's no difference. But as you start getting even hotter, you can see those temperatures drop. And remember, uh, some of the predictions even for mid-century in the eastern seaboard were about 1.1 to 4.5 degrees Celsius. So that would put us between this range and between here. Okay. So that's where you know, the concern, that's where this idea of even a 2 degree increase in temperature is going to have severe impacts, again, if we do not adapt. That's my idea. I think, uh, I think adaptation is going to require land reconfiguration, for lack of a better word, that crops that are historically growing, I mean, land areas that are historically growing some crops are going to have to look at growing other crops. And I, I don't think that has to be a policy. I think farmers are going to adapt. You know. It could be, yeah. yeah. Although I, I can't talk about policy, especially because I'm being recorded. But I'm just ex exercising that as an academic suggestion. It would make, have merit, perhaps, yeah. So, okay, to, car, to kind of summarize all this, we know crops are going to respond strongly to temperature. It influences all aspects of growth and development. Most crops are being grown near those optimum temperatures, and that makes sense, right? You're not going to grow a crop that's not optimum for your, for your area. Okay, and that would apply for adaptation responses, too. You're going to, you're going to change. Um, okay, optimums vary for different stages, crops, and even cultivars. So, again, genetics is a possible area of ad adaptation as well. And I didn't really talk about this, but even short-term temperatures can have a big impact on yield. Okay, I mentioned the grain filling or the uh, pollen germination as an example of that. And uh, I have a slide later when we look at some of the model predictions that show that, um, you know, the CO2 fertilization is great like we talked about. However, the negative impact of, of warming air is stronger than CO2 alone. And that's really why you know, climate change involves the three factors, CO2, temperature, and water. And although CO2 is generally positive, temperature is overcoming that positive response. Okay, when you put those three together, that's what's happening. Um, okay, this gets a little complicated. This is some of my own research. And I mentioned that doing these interactions is really important because climate change is involving changes in those three factors at the same time. And uh, what these graphs are showing is uh, basically, okay, this happens to be potato yield uh, at different air temperatures. And the open circle is elevated to close its ambient. And what they're showing is that even at very high temperatures, you do have slightly significantly higher yields, but it's not enough, set, it's not enough to offset that negative impact of temperature. Okay. This is the same thing uh, for maize. Now, this is yield, not photosynthesis. And so uh, the gentleman over there mentioned having a C4 crops having a higher or broader temperature band of sensitivity. And so you can see the same high temperatures, maize yield is, is relatively unaffected, but then after a certain point, it does drop down. Okay. And actually, you can see... Uh, even cold temperatures got a much higher yield. I'm not quite sure about that data point, but <clears throat> that's what we had, we had observed. So interactions uh, can tell us are probably more realistic as to what's happening. This was supposed to be about, C this was supposed to be about CO2 and temperature, but I had to mention rainfall because it's the other big factor. And all I'm going to say about it is it's complicated, okay, which is a really big cop-out, but I, can't, I don't think I can get into too much detail on this, except to tell you uh, this happens to be irrigated maize. This is grain yield. Uh, no difference. And warming temperatures, no difference between ambient or elevated CO2 uh, production for irrigated corn. Uh, although the evapotranspiration rate is quite a bit lower okay, for corn grown ambient. No effect on yield, but water use is much lower. Rain fed yield now is a big difference. Okay, and this is because although we said C4 crops don't really respond directly to photosynthetically to elevated CO2, they are using water more efficiently than under ambient conditions because of stomatal closure. 
And so if water becomes limiting, you can actually get higher yields because of that. Okay, so again, this, you know, not everything is doom and gloom, and this could be positive for especially some of the rain-fed productions in the developing countries. Okay. Um, last topic, and I'll try to breeze through this. There's not too much left. Is that those model, I mean, those, uh, that data basically forms the basis for a lot of the yield predictions that we see in the literature. Okay, so now you have a sense of where the data is coming from, what it looks like, what it means. Okay, what do we do about it? So predictions of crop response to climate change involve lots of things. So the models are needed, and they're estimating the climate change, temporal and spatial aspects. And I mentioned I'm not an expert in this, and so I'm not going to cover it. Uh, but I am more of an expert in the crop responses. And I can tell you, we, we develop models with USDA. And they involve lots and lots and lots of observable data and ground truthing. Okay, we're, we're very much concerned, and we know it's a major contentious point, climate change. Um, the scientific integrity is critical. Okay, so we want to ground truth our data wherever possible. And in fact, we, I'm even involved in pro, uh, projects where we are comparing our different models for the same commodity against common data sets to see how well they agree with each other and try to get a sense of how good or bad the science is in our models. 